The uh, next question um, relates to some figures which we'll look at in a minute. They're the, the radiographs of a 59-year-old uh, man. And this relates to complications of uh, revision surgery. Um, he's seen in follow-up after a primary TKA seven years prior. Uh, he'd been doing well until recently and then developed some swelling and pain in the knee. So several years of good function, um, symptom-free interval, and then symptoms developing late uh, to midterm after um, knee arthroplasty. Laboratory tests are reassuring without suggestion of infection, although we often will frequently aspirate anyway, even in the face of negative lab tests to be certain. Uh, to get the additional data points, the cell count, um, and the culture. Since it is possible to have infection with uh, normal labs with low-grade uh, indolent organisms. But uh, the question here is, um, what are we going to do based on the x-rays? And uh, this shows the films. And I think these project pretty well. Um, I think you can see that there is significant osteolysis of the medial femoral condyle. And there's some on the lateral side, too. If you look really straight lateral from the femoral component, the decreased density going on there. And then on the lateral view uh, of the knee, uh, significant lysis uh, uh, behind this um, implant. And um, the question is, um, you know, what, what's the best form of treatment? And um, the size of this lesion really makes bone grafting or some um, partial treatment uh, modality uh, inappropriate. Um, and I think revision of both components would be what we would favor. And, um, and that was uh, the answer by the majority. Um, I think uh, you know there have been uh, reports of bone grafting, but I would encourage people to consider that for very limited size lesions that don't have risk of uh, secondary fracture from the uh, stress riser, because sometimes you make it worse. Uh, temporarily while you make a hole to try to bone graft the thing. Um, causes of failure after total knee replacement um, from um, this uh, uh, article from uh, the Rothman Group. Um, aseptic loosening is the most common cause of late revision, greater than two years, with the tibia more frequently loosening than the femoral component. Uh, it can be hard to see femoral component loosening, uh, particularly with a PS design, the box will hide your view of the femoral condyles. Oblique views can help, as Dr. Skulko said earlier. Um, it's also important to get films that are not tangential, but are looking down the interfaces of the implant. So it's very helpful to have spot views or fluoroscopically controlled views in patients where you're having trouble making a diagnosis and you're concerned there might be occult loosening. Serial x-rays are extremely valuable. Whenever you can get uh, sequential films over a period of years, always try to do that. It sometimes makes some changes that are subtle, um, uh, suddenly auto, uh, very, very uh, obvious. And um, osteolytic uh, changes can begin um, as you approach uh, seven to 10 years. Um, so be aware of that as a, um, another cause. Uh, particularly with metal back modular implants, um, there is uh, that second wear interface behind the poly, backside wear with abrasion of the top of the metal tray. Um, the metal debris uh, serves as a third body particle, drives particle size down. It's the small particles that are really um, biologically extremely active and produce the uh, very large lytic lesions in some of these patients. Um, septic failure, 27%. Uh, um, I guess we should be happy that septic failure is showing up as such a large number of failures. It means the other things are going away in the old years. And years ago, there were a lot of other things that were a lot more common, but uh, <clears throat> septic failure remains a real challenge. Ligament and uh, ligamentous laxity, only 8% in this series. Um, I must say that's uh, higher in our practice, our revision practice here. Uh, we see a lot of uh, instability as a cause of unhappy knees, especially early after arthroplasty and especially flexion instability, which can often be missed uh, clinically. Uh, and we'll talk more about that with some of the case examples coming up. But um, flexion instability uh, related to failure to balance the, the flexion extension gap. And um, when the knee is tighter in extension and loose in flexion, 
uh, can slide around in an anterior posterior direction, cause pain at the pes, pain at the end of the uh, at the end of the IT band at Gertie's tubercle. Many times these patients complain of pain, the inability to trust their knee. They don't use the words that we usually associate with knee laxity or instability from our sports experience, uh, but that's the cause of the trouble. <clears throat> Be on the lookout for undersized femoral components on the lateral x-ray, excessive posterior slope, um, and um, uh, you know many times these problems can occur in combination. Um, two or three things contributing to the imbalance. Remember, flexion contracture is the other side of the same coin. Just means you have a thicker poly. Now the knee may not be as loose in flexion, but it won't extend all the way. And sometimes you'll see patients with both. Just this past week, patient with a flexion contracture and also excessive laxity in flexion. These can occur in a delayed way, especially in CR knees if people uh, have a delayed rupture of their PCL. So it sometimes is not always uh, present immediately from the time of surgery in some of the CR patients. Periprosthetic fracture, about 5%, um, and perhaps uh, on the rise a little bit um, with the aging population, some of the osteolysis uh, patients that we take care of. Arthrofibrosis, 5%. This is a real problem. Uh, depends on how you define arthrofibrosis. If you uh, start talking about uh, painful stiff knees, some of which may have 90 degrees of flexion or so, um, this number starts to get even bigger because it's a relatively common cause of complaint and uh, is uh, sometimes uh, due to patient factors. But I must say the majority of these cases that I see have um, other uh, technical errors related to implant uh, insertion. Either that or internally rotated tubular components somehow uh, influence uh, gene regulation and turn on the arthrofibrosis genes because it's amazing how many of these patients have uh, technical errors related to their components as well. Um, but, uh, patellar clunk syndrome has been, just been discussed and um, is uh, not quite as, um, as dramatic with today's implants, I believe. Um, we don't have the big clunks like we did just a decade ago, but, uh, but more crepitus and uh, you know, Velcro kind of thing in some of these knees. If it doesn't hurt, ignore it. It's not harmful. You can reassure the patient. But if it causes pain, uh, it can be uh, treated effectively with arthroscopic debridement. And that seems to be effective over the long term for most of these patients. Why it doesn't come back again, I, I must say I don't really understand. But the majority of patients who have an arthroscopic debridement of their clunk uh, do not have recurrence of those symptoms. And then finally, the great bugaboo, metal hypersensitivity. Does it exist really? Um, how big a deal is this? And, and once again, I must say, many of the patients that I've had referred to me with questions of metal hypersensitivity uh, somehow um, have seemed to be predisposed to having nickel allergy uh, in, in relationship to, or nickel allergy somehow causes uh, uh, component malrotation and um, uh, ligamentous uh, imbalance in these joints. Uh, um, axial malalignment and other technical errors because frequently uh, there's another cause. Um, so I think when you see somebody um, with uh, problems with their total knee, it's very important to take a history and perform a physical. It sounds stupid, but H&P is the basis of all we do in medicine. And it's amazing how many times a patient will tell you what's wrong, maybe not in exactly the words you're looking for, but if you listen to them, the clues are there. Um, it's important to find out how, how painful their knee was before the original arthroplasty. Did they really have arthritis? Were they one of these patients with minimal arthritis that's never done very well from the beginning? How was their preoperative range of motion, their ambulatory status, any history of infection, both after the index arthroplasty, but also prior to that, years ago, with penetrating injuries to the knee or other uh, problems, uh, prior surgeries meniscectomies, you have to ask the question because they won't always tell you unless you directly query them. Histories of thrombophlebitis, uh, history of uh, uh, comorbidities that may impact on the outcome of the implant um, uh, that you may be putting in for revision. All these things are very, very important. And then um, it's good to get the stickies, the little sticky stickies that go in the, the chart uh, that detail the implant the patient received. It's hard to get them. But a lot of hospitals have this someplace in their records. 
and it's much more reliable than dictated operative notes. I'm sorry, gentlemen and ladies, all of us uh, tend not to be 100% reliable with our dictated operative notes in terms of implant sizing, um, the details of the actual devices that are used, but those stickies don't lie. Uh, they tell you what was used, and uh, they're very, very helpful. Um, review prior records, and then uh, prior images, very helpful in assessing whether there's been a change in an, in an implant over time. Um, the temporal course of patient symptoms, very, very important. And uh, of course, uh, those things that uh, are related to the pain. Is it activity related, weight bearing, uh, mechanical sort of symptoms? Pain is present all the time, um, continuous day and night. Uh, other features, uh, you know, pain in other locations, um, radiating all around the body, uh, you know, severity of pain. You know, 15 on a scale of 0 to 10, some of those things are red flags. And um, it doesn't mean there can't be real pathology there. It means it's going to be harder to figure out what's wrong with that patient. Um, stiffness doesn't always correlate with range of motion. Sometimes people can move their knee, but it doesn't move easily, and they have discomfort. And so they'll describe that with different words, and stiffness is often one of the words that's used to describe uh, that. And it seems puzzling when someone sits there and goes from 0 to 120 degrees, but they doesn't feel right and it hurts them through a portion of their arc of motion. Um, and then um, the things that bring on particular types of instability, very helpful. So for flexion instability, there's some key questions. Um, stairs, but particularly going downstairs, are a problem for patients with flexion instability um, in the same way that, uh, you know, Patients with uh, ACL deficient knees have trouble with, you know, pivoting, uh, rotating, cutting type maneuvers. So ask specifically about that. Um, start open. Ask them if there are certain activities that bother them and they don't mention stairs. Ask them specifically about uh, stairs, ramps, that sort of thing. Um, very important. Um, on physical exam, Watching people walk can provide you real clues, uh, whether they're fully extending their knee during stance phase. It turns out it takes a lot of energy to walk with your knee flexed. You can all try this after this broadcast and get up and walk around like a monkey for about five minutes, and you'll start burning your quads really quick. Uh, so patients who have even a relatively mild flexion contracture um, may really uh, be bothered by this because of decreased endurance and strength and uh, uh, symptoms they get from this in, in terms of their exercise tolerance. Measure range of motion both passively and actively. It's good to do that with a goniometer. Uh, there's data to show a lot of inner observer variability and people just sort of guessing on range of motion, you know, as they have somebody uh, go back and forth a couple of times. Um, skin changes, presence of effusion, uh, the warmth of the, the part, um, other clues for complex regional pain syndrome, you know, uh, asymmetry in terms of the, the hair on the leg or the uh, color or appearance of the limb, um, the, the appearance of the skin, is it shiny? Not all pa patients with um, uh, RSD or complex regional pain syndromes will have these florid findings, but some will, and so it's worth making note of that uh, in the event it's present. Um, ligamentous laxity on exam, really important. We all examine these knees uh, routinely, but it's so easy to miss significant laxity, and um, particularly um, not, not just you know medial lateral laxity and extension. Most people pick up on that. Flex the knee 20, 30 degrees. Check again, and then um, when you do your Lachman or anterior posterior drawer with the patient on the exam table, knee flex 90 degrees seems okay. You're not done. You need to have the patient sit on the table or on a chair in the exam room with their foot flat on the floor and check the AP stability of that knee. For some reason, a lot of patients with flexion instability, when a big guy like me or you comes and grabs that leg and starts shaking it around and their knee hurts, they co-contract their muscles and you can miss significant laxity just like you might in a young athlete with an ACL tear. And so. If you sit them in a chair put, and they put their foot flat on the floor, for some reason they relax, 
and you can much more easily detect significant AP laxity. We'll unmask this uh, quite well on exam. I always, always, always check that uh, because otherwise you can miss uh, significant AP laxity inflection. And then pay attention to pel patellar tracking. And while you examine the knee, put your hand on the front of the knee because sometimes um, you can feel crepitus from patellar clunk or from a worn joint and of someone with a primary, with a, a knee that's never been operated. You can feel st some of these things um, even if you can't hear them as some of us, our hearing starts to go as the years go by, but, uh, but you'll be able to feel the crepitus transmitted to your ball. So the next question relating to total knee complications and revision, um, self-assessment exam question, a uh, 65-year-old woman, she underwent a right knee arthroplasty 12 years ago. She reports that she's had pain for the past year. So. 11 years, no pain. Now she's had pain for a year. She has range of motion from 0 to 100 degrees. And uh, standing AP radiograph three years ago is available. So we have sequential films. That's really good. A film from when she was doing fine. And then recent x-rays for comparison. Once again, her laboratory tests are reassuring for the uh, question or concern of infection. And so the question is, what's wrong? Infection, ligamentous laxity, poly wear, is this an extensor mechanism problem, some technical error of total knee? All these things may be going through your head as you pull up the x-ray. And um, here are the films. Um, this shows um, the uh, original films uh, from three years ago on the left uh, with view of both knees. And on the right, we have an AP and a lateral of the knee currently. And um, you might at first glance think, well, it's projected a little differently than he's rotated. But um, if we look, uh, it appears uh, something's happened on the femoral side. Uh, the knee was very nicely aligned, perfectly aligned before, um, and now no longer an appropriate amount of uh, valgus. This, this femoral comp component has collapsed. It's changed position. On the lateral view, uh, this is what I was talking about before with PS designs. You can't really see the distal end of the femur, but look under the flange and that gap that's occurred, the separation of the uh, flange from the bone, because this thing has dropped into varus, but it's also flexed uh, a little bit on the distal femur. So uh, the answer is polyethylene wear because that's the root cause at this time interval, 12 years, of late loosening. So it's a loose implant, but loosening is not one of the choices you have here. Otherwise, you could answer that, and this would be a bad question. But uh, polywear, the root cause of late loosening like this, and I think uh, careful inspection of the uh, uh, components and perhaps the radiographs would show uh, some evidence of uh, osteolysis in association with the loosening, but maybe not. You can have lysis with complete loss of, um, you know, a lot of bone in the condyles and not really see it very well on a PS femur. <clears throat> so um, for imaging purposes, serial AP and lateral radiographs, really helpful. Weight-bearing films provide additional information uh, and sometimes will allow you to see the asymmetric wear with a narrower medial side than lateral side. Um, always, always, always get skyline views or merchant views of the patella so you can assess patellar tracking. Uh, sometimes you can see patellar fractures and other pathology that you will not see very easily on, on an AP and lateral x-ray. When you think about it, it's satisfying the basic principle we all learned as residents. You know, you would never think of seeing a tibia fracture and taking care of it with a single AP view. So why would you take care of someone's patella with a single lateral x-ray? Because you can't really see the patella very well on an AP view. So the sunrise view gives you the second view that's essential for adequate assessment of the patella should always be done on every single knee x-ray you get of somebody. So we always get three pictures of every knee, no matter what, AP, lateral, and sunrise view. They get a film. They get three, uh, three uh, exposures at our place. Um, AP pelvis um, is really helpful to rule out hip pathology. If you get a standing full-length x-ray routinely of patients when they have painful total knees, for alignment, it's a freebie, and it's a reminder. When you look at that full-length standing x-ray for alignment, 
always look at the hip. I can't tell you the number of times people at our place have picked up hip pathology thanks to a full-length standing x-ray. We'd like to think that they would have picked it up on their exam because every patient with knee problems should have a hip exam as well. But I must tell you, um, I'm sure that those standing x-rays have saved us a few times when uh, hip pathology would otherwise have been mess missed. And we have a collection of cases here of patients who've referred with painful uh, revision total knees, unresponsive to two or three surgeries somewhere else, good looking x-rays, a little flexion contracture, complaints of pain in their knee, and the problem all along was a completely worn out hip that nobody picked up on. And um, you know, their knee pain is cured by having their total hip re replaced, their hip replaced. So uh, be on the lookout for this because they're out there. Um, CT, um, really controversial in terms of its value. Um, I, I know some people like to get it, uh, uh, you know, to look at uh, osteolytic lesions and see how big they are. Um, we kind of like to, you know, uh, look at those with uh, binocular white light navigation at the time of surgery, you know. If you're going to operate on them anyway, you're going to see, see the defects. But I think in situations where it may require that you bring in special resources, and, and you have to be able to plan to, for whether it's a big case or a smaller case. Uh, it may be that in that situation, CT would be of greater value. Um, I think that uh, uh, the other thing that's possible to do with CT is look at component rotation. Uh, it's kind of hard sometimes to know for sure. There's a lot of inter observer variability in these uh, measurements, but um, it, it is. Uh, good to think this way, to think of component rotation. And uh, sometimes if you, someone, you're not sure whether uh, someone should be operated or not and you're searching for a mechanical cause of pain, there are situations where it may be the piece of data that tips you over and helps you decide uh, uh, to go ahead and operate on someone. But uh, I'm much, it's much easier for me to, to see malrotated components at the time of surgery than it is to uh, tell precisely uh, what's going on on CT scan, to be honest. Um, bone scan we get very, very rarely. Uh, it's done a lot. I don't think it's, it's extremely helpful. Um, bone scans are going to be positive for a lot of reasons. You know, if somebody's done almost anything they need to stir it up, there can be some increased uptake. Remember bone scans, how they work. Um, increased blood flow and new bone formation. The, the, the medications are deposited and are specific to those two things. So anything that causes that to happen will cause a positive bone scan, and the list is long. If you have a stone cold bone scan, there may be times uh, to kind of reassure you that you're not missing something on someone with uh, six or seven cats uh, and a couple, you know, 12 tattoos that you're not so sure you want to operate on, uh, but you're afraid you might be missing something uh, in terms of real pathology. A really stone cold bone scan can help you a lot. Um, let's see if we can get this to advance. There we go. Okay, so um, this uh, question 42, 75-year-old um, male requires revision knee arthroplasty 15 years after the index procedure. The operative report stated that the surgeon used standard size cemented posterior cruciate sacrificing component size 13 highly cross-linked liner. What would be the most likely etiology at this point 15 years after index operation with uh, good function for many years and aseptic loosening is the answer. Uh, other things can happen. Uh, you can have secondary instability because of poly wear. So sometimes they'll come in with instability symptoms because of the wear, um, but um, that's not as common as, as loosening of the components. Um, and the other answers uh, on this list uh, less likely. Um, we'll talk about prosthesis selection. Um, some of this is kind of personal preference, but it's good to know when um, people who always do things one way start switching to a different technique. The things that drive you from less constraint to more constraint, even if you're inclined to use a, a lesser degree of constraint routinely. So an unconstrained posterior crucial retaining um, you know, CR type knee is uh, 
indicated when the post recruit is intact. And, um, you know, if the PCL is gone, um, there are ways to torture the procedure, use dish inserts or other things to try to make a, a, a CR femur work and so on. But basically, <clears throat> the concept is uh, CR needs require an intact PCL. That means intact. Um, if it's really pathologic or uh, it requires a great deal of uh, release uh, for balancing, then uh, those are situations where you may want to think about uh, switching to a, uh, uh, you know, a posterior stabilized uh, type of implant. Um, and so, uh, of course, as everyone knows, some folks tend to use, um, you know, uh, uh, posterior stabilized implants routinely for, for all of their knees. Um, I think for the occasional surgeon, it's a good choice uh, in terms of implants because there's a wider range of pathology you can take care of with a, uh, you know, uh, poster stabilized implant. Uh, CR knees are great, but uh, you can't use them for everybody, and it gets hard to, uh, or at least more difficult to make them work in people with flexion contractors and valgus and other issues of this sort. So uh, I think uh, uh, it's nice to be able to do one procedure this pretty much the same way with some variation on soft tissue uh, balancing and, and know you're going to have a, big, a, a very reliable choice. So um, we, we teach both here, but uh, we tell our, our, our uh, residents who are leaving who are going to be doing you know, occasional total knees in, uh, in sort of a general practice that we think a uh, poster stabilized implant is a really good choice. So this next question. Um, 64-year-old female with rheumatoid arthritis. That's a red flag. There are not a lot of them around anymore with DMARS. And uh, some of the younger surgeons on the, on the, on the uh, line tonight may not have seen a lot of RA patients, but um, special issues, so your antennas are up automatically, uh, undergoing left total knee arthroplasty. Um, during the tibial cut, uh, the, uh, the ligament, a ligament is transected. I think we all know which one, uh, uh, the usual uh, uh, victim. And um, the ligament is not repairable, uh, which I think is unusual. I mean, usually it's a saw cut or occasionally an osteotome or retractor, but <coughs> you usually are able to repair uh, the ligament. But uh, in this case, not repairable. So uh, the surgeon is trying to balance the knee finds that there's uh, valgus instability greater than a centimeter, no stop, so complete disruption, both the deep and superficial. And so what implant uh, should you bail to in this situation? Um, you know, I think that uh, at a minimum, um, a varus valgus constrained implant uh, would be the choice in this patient. Uh, and I say at a minimum because that's what we would prefer to do. Um, it's possible, and it's been described, to, re to repair the ligament, uh, augment it with uh, autogenous tissues, and uh, make less constrained implants work. I think that's a little bit of a party trick. Great if you can pull it off, but a lot safer to repair the ligament as well as you possibly can. So you think it's going to be great, but then protect the ligament with a, a CCK constrained condylar TC3 style implant that has varus valgus constraint to protect the repair. And then I put those patients in a brace. I'm not sure the brace does a lot. I think it does provide a little bit of protection, slows them down. And it tells them something special happened here. You need to be careful this first six or eight weeks, not get crazy, not be falling down, don't disrupt the repair. Um, I think. Uh, there are situations where the final answer number five is right, where a rotating hinge would be a good choice. Some rheumatoid patients have significant ligamentous imbalance anyway. Uh, it's not uncommon to have valgus knees of significance, flexion contracture in some of the rheumatoid patients. If the, if the MCL is already stretched attenuated and, and you disrupt it with uh, someone pulling on a retractor or your exposure somehow or with a uh, saw blade cut, um, and you've got balancing problems, uh, and especially if your flexion gap is difficult to control, um, there 
may be times when uh, a primary rotating hinge is a good choice. Some of these patients have stretched out posterior capsule, their knee hyperextends. Hyperextension is really a hard thing to control, and so even a higher level of constraint is an appropriate thing to consider. And for patient, for those of you who wish to do these more challenging cases, severe rheumatoids, and so on, you may have you know what you're intending to do, but you have to have backup options, plan B, plan C, if things go wrong and the wheels come off. So uh, the answer here, uh, varus valgus constraint, 84%, uh, we're able to get that uh, correct. Uh, remember, PCL uh, substituting knees, posterior stabilized knees, do not have any medial lateral uh, constraint. They don't provide any medial lateral stability. So just because they have a post doesn't mean they're going to help you. Um, that large central post in the varus valgus constraint knees uh, does engage the sidewalls and provide some protection. Um, if you have a completely absent MCL, you can have late failure of these implants, though. Um, they can uh, deform the post, break it off or wear it off, and uh, have recurrent symptoms late. Um, the same is true with uh, you know, severe lateral uh, 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 ligamentous injury. Um, in the old days with the really extensive lateral releases for valgus, basically an iatrogenic injury to the lateral structures, it's possible in a figure four position for people to jump their post and uh, dislocate the post out of the housing. So uh, it, it isn't a perfect answer, uh, but I think it is something that can work particularly if you have intermediate levels of uh, laxity, shall we say. But I get nervous if there's complete absence of ligaments and I'm trying to depend on a big hunk of plastic. And we start thinking about uh, hinges in some of those circumstances. A constrained hinge, these days usually with a rotating platform to try to relieve stresses at the fixation interfaces on the bone. Um, a good choice, an important tool for complex revision surgery when you have major ligamentous laxity on either side of the knee, and when you have uh, flexion gap uh, laxity uh, where you simply can't balance the knee. Uh, you can't put in a big enough femoral component, nor can you, you know, uh, elevate the joint line far enough and have plastic thick enough to fill up that flexion space. It's physically impossible, and then it's an indication for rotating hinge. The other special scenario uh, where uh, we found on a review of polio patients here at our institution where rotating hinges are indicated is in some, not all, but some polio patients. And specifically, if patients have less than anti-gravity strength of their quadriceps, uh, they will do better with a rotating hinge than with less constrained implants. And it has to do with uh, per the hyperextension that can occur um, and, and the stretching that can occur over time without the hinge. Now, this is a little tricky because people without quad strength have to be able to hyperextend a few degrees to keep from falling down without a brace. If you give a polio patient with uh, absent quad function a flexion contracture, you doom them, you doom them to a lifetime with a double upright brace with drop locks because if their knee is flexed, they can't decelerate and keep from falling down. They'll fall on their nose and uh, uh, they, they can't trust their limb. And so if you watch polio patients who haven't had surgery, they all hyperextend their leg and sometimes rotate it internal or external in order to lock it into extension so that they can go over the top of that leg and walk without a brace. They've all worn braces when they are younger. They all hate braces. They all want to not wear a brace if there's any way they can get away with it. And uh, they need to have a little bit of extension, and a rotating hinge can allow them to do that. Um, once in a while, we'll do this for Charcot joints as well, although I must tell you, uh, when we have patients where we're pretty sure it's a Charcot, um, we, we will often begin the journey, and I think it's a journey of serial uh, implants for many of these people. Uh, with a varus valgus constrained implant, a LCCK style, try to make that work. It's really hard to predict the ones that it's going to work in and the ones that won't. And uh, if you can make that work with less constraint, I think there's uh, 
less chance they're going to uh, knock the heck out of the uh, fixation. Uh, but uh, tough problems and uh, uh, difficult to manage as a primary arthroplasty. So the next question, complications in revision module exam number 25. 65-year-old uh, male presents with aseptic loosening three years post-TKA. Um, the uh, surgeon uh, looks at the films, takes him to the operating room for revision, and during surgery had to pick a special exposure. And he chose uh, the uh, exposure shown in figure A. So we'll see figure A. And then the question is, which of the following x-rays was, was the reason that he chose that exposure? So here is figure A, and that is a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So you can see the patella, uh, the tubercle osteotomy tapering, as is a nice way to do it. Um, the top end kind of flared. We will often uh, create a shelf there and try to tuck the thing underneath, but that's a matter of technique, trying to prevent proximal migration of that tubercle piece. But uh, when is that indicated? When is that most helpful? As we look at these various x-rays, it's quite a collection of pathology, but most of them look like really unstable, uh, lax knees. Those usually aren't that hard to get into. They may be hard to stabilize, but they're not that hard to expose. The exception is x-ray D with patella baja. And uh, exposure in a patient with limited flexion and patella baja can be difficult. Um, and so I think that's the best choice, the best answer in, um, of those available. And so uh, that indeed was chosen by two-thirds uh, with a smattering of the others. Um, now, to be honest, um, of the different uh, surgical exposures available, um, I must tell you we would not necessarily always use a uh, tubercle osteotomy for patella baja, and then we'll get to uh, some of the other exposures here shortly. Um, during uh, revision surgery, um, you have certain general steps that you have to accomplish. Every revision starts with, after exposure, extraction of the components, hopefully with minimal damage to the host bone. Uh, and then uh, an assessment of bone deficiencies and a plan early on and how those deficiencies are going to be managed. And then the reconstruction begins on the tibial side of the joint. So the tibial platform is reestablished and the knee is built off the tibia. So creating a stable supported platform, hopefully at a relatively appropriate level so that you don't have to use huge pieces of plastic to build up that tibial tray. Uh, you can then go over to the femoral side, begin with the flexion gap and the extension gap and build the knee off the tibia. The size of the femoral component, the position of the femoral component, proximal and distal, is dictated by soft tissue balancing. So balancing the knee ligaments after establishing the tibial platform is the essential pathway to success. And then you have to have stable implants well supported on host bone. And then of course adequate soft tissue coverage. And hopefully you've thought of that at the beginning in people with bad soft tissues and not at the end of the operation because you may need help from a plastic surgeon and that has to be arranged. So surgical exposure needs to be extensile. You'll be able to see what you're doing. A medial peripatellar approach can get you to work in the majority of the revisions as long as you know how to release the periosteally, the medial side of the tibia, all the way around to the posterior medial corner, externally rotating the foot and subluxing, not everting the patella because that will allow you to expose the femur and the tibia in the majority of patients after releasing appropriately intra-articular intra, uh, scar, freeing up the medial lateral gutter. Um, when that doesn't work, then we will quite frequently and routinely go to a quadriceps snip. This further reduces the tension in the extensor mechanism. You want to protect the patellar tendon attachment to the tibia, not have that pull off, and so quad snip 
has no penalty. We repair it with non-absorbable sutures, but we don't change the post-op recovery at all. And it can really help you protect your extensor mechanism from iatrogenic damage. And uh, that plus external rotation of the tibia will allow you to access the majority of the knees. A couple of times a year in a busy revision practice, that's not enough, and we'll have to do a tubercle osteotomy. Uh, these are usually special circumstances. And honestly, it, more ha it happens more often in primaries than it does in revisions. Very unusual primaries. We had a, a lady with a machete injury from Somalia whose knee hadn't bent for, you know, many, many years. It was basically ankylosed, although there was a, just enough motion to make it hurt. That kind of thing. Um, people with, uh, you know, really severely contracted joints where, and, and bad bone quality where you're really worried about uh, damaging the bone or causing a fracture, trying to get into these people is sometimes um, better to do a controlled release of that sort. After you've exposed the joint, you have to remove the implants. Um, <coughs> it's important to, uh, you know, uh, be patient with implant removal, divide the interface between the undersurface of the tray and the underside of the femoral component, and then uh, disimpact these implants. Sometimes uh, there can be difficulty with stem extensions. Know the implant, look up kind of how things fit together, Make sure you have the right screwdrivers to take, take out screws or bolts that may fix a tray to a stem. These things can save you time and prevent significant bony injury during the procedure. Um, after you've got the components out, tibia side first, as we said. Um, then go to the, the femoral side, balance the flexion extension gaps, uh, and also medial lateral stability. Uh, if there uh, is uh, medial lateral asymmetry, uh, perform uh, uh, releases as necessary. Uh, we favor pie crusting type of releases on the lateral side for sure. And, and actually uh, have started doing a few of those on the medial side with a needle uh, in some select instances. And that seems to work when the usual subperiosteal release is not sufficient. Uh, keep track of the patella and how it's tracking. Uh, the patella is the canary in the coal mine. So if the canary drops off of its perch, you need to be worried about something going on. It's a warning, and it's usually not the patella's fault. There's something else wrong in that joint. Component malrotation, some kind of issues that are leading to um, patellar, patellofemoral tracking. Once in a rare while, you'll have a patella that's been you know, dislocated chronically for a long time, and a lot of you know, extensive lateral release is required. But the majority of our revision surgeries were not doing extensive lateral releases. Uh, maybe minimal um, kind of circum uh, a teller release on the lateral side, but certainly not the old up and down lateral releases of years gone by. Uh, if you get the components in the right place and the knee balanced, um, the patella tends to track pretty well. The tapaseal bone replacement. Uh, this is a big topic. Uh, it's one where there's been a lot of action in the last few years. What we've learned is that um, it's not enough to put uh, a flat tibial component or ephemeral component on the end of the bone, have big cavitary holes in the metaphysis, and then stick some kind of stem up the bone and think it's going to work. Whether you press fit the stem or cement it, failure rates are high. And so metaphyseal support is necessary both for axial load bearing, but rotation. And we think the rotational stability that they provide, um, that is provided by the metaphysis, is the critical issue. There are different ways to do it. You can try to impaction graft the host bone if it's cavitated. You can use structural allografts in some cases if you're missing a condyle in the femur. And then there are also sleeves and cones designed to restore metaphyseal support. But this, since we've kind of moved towards aggressive metaphyseal reconstruction, um, it has been a game changer for improving the durability of fixation in our own uh, hands in our, in our revision practice. Classification of bone defects, uh, the, the AORI uh, classification, the Anderson Clinic uh, classification scheme uh, is the one used by most. 
It's relatively straightforward. Uh, it can be remembered. That's an advantage. It doesn't do a perfect job of telling you what to do, like some classification schemes and other joints. So that's a, a weakness, but uh, it allows us to communicate and talk to each other. And so you can see the chart here. The type 1s are minor bone defects, really haven't lost much bone. And you can use standard revision components um, with uh, short stems if you cement, longer press fit stems if you wish, and minimal additional adjunctive um, uh, implant add-ons. Um, metaphyseal bone damage um, requires something to, co to kind of fill in the defects. Sometimes uh, cement can be used, or even cement and screws, as described by Merrill Ritter's group on the femoral side and tibial side. Um, some of the block augments that the manufacturers all carry will uh, occasionally fit a defect quite well and restore that rotational control and actual support that's needed. And then uh, cement filling of smaller defects also uh, reasonable. As we start to get to major damage of the condyles, uh, this is where um, there may be a difference between what's sufficient to get you out of the operating room, but what is necessary for long-term fixation. And we know that as bone deformities, as bone uh, defects get worse, risk of loosening goes up with standard techniques. So some people will still try to just fill these with cement or use those standard block augments, maybe small bone grafts. Uh, the small bone grafts can resorb and uh, have about, uh, you know, a 25% failure rate by seven or eight years uh, in a series from our institution. So not that they don't work, but a lot of them resorb and cause uh, intermediate term loosening. So this is where we start thinking about adjunctive measures trying to restore better support and where the different manufacturers have a variety of implants to try to restore metaphyseal bone damage. One side, both sides, a variety of strategies for doing that. And then the more severe de defects, where you really are missing a whole bunch of bone, um, you have to either use bulk allografts, custom implants, uh, or uh, you know tumor-type replacement devices, uh, particularly if uh, you're missing your collateral ligaments, you get into a rotating hinge type of device. But even with the rotating hinges, that restoration of metaphysis for rotational control and enhanced fixation is, we think, extremely valuable. So we actually start uh, further up the line and more minor defects using smaller uh, porous metal um, uh, sleeves or inserts, cones, trying to get what is hybrid fixation, both cement and porous ingrowth. The cement holds it still at the beginning, allowing the bone to grow into the motionless interface of the porous metal part of the implant. As the bone grows into the porous metal part, the stresses on the cement go down and it is protected. So um, reconstruction addressed with long stems to promote load sharing. If you're a press fitter, uh, short to intermediate length stems uh, if you cement. The advantage of the press fit stems, uh, they're technically uh, relatively straightforward. Um, uh, there's no ingrowth. They guide the alignment of the implants, which is a huge advantage, um, but can get you into trouble when you start getting real long and there's a bow in the bone on either femoral tibial side. There are offset type mechanisms to try to compensate for that, but it starts to get more difficult as you get longer in a curved bone. Cemented stems have the advantage of uh, being more easily adapted to uh, some of these bones with curves. Um, uh, they deliver cement delivers antibiotics because we usually get antibiotic cement. That's an advantage. It's good for poor quality, you know, very large, uh, capacious type bony cavities where you, you may not have a stem big enough to fit inside some giant femur. Um, but um, it can be more difficult to remove. We get around that by coupling it with a porous cone, uh, an intermediate length stem, 60 millimeters or so, very revisable. And intraoperative x-rays to make sure that we have the alignment right since we don't have that long stem to kind of make the alignment, uh, put the alignment part of the operation on autopilot, which is what you get from the long stems to some degree. So cavitary defect filling, small defects as you see here, uh, cement, um, 
good choice. Metaphyseal sleeves, advantages as we've discussed already. Um, these fit onto the implant and are impacted. It can be hard to fit the defect perfectly and get perfect rotation and position of the components, but with proper instrumentation, that can be made more easy. Uh, they do; they are expensive. They can be difficult to remove, and uh, they're very implant specific. So you can't use them from one manufacturer to another. Um, the porous metal cones um, uh, tend to be uh, a little more adaptable. We can use them with a whole host of different implant types that we have, uh, but they're expensive. They can be difficult to remove in the one scenario, which is rare, thank goodness, of late infection. So implant surgery's done, bone grows in, everything looks fine. Some years later, perhaps with hematogenous seeding, infection occurs. We've had a very few handful of cases like this, difficult to remove, and um, can result in significant bone loss. So um, that's the downside of, uh, of the large size cones. Smaller cones easier because you can get the implant out and work around them with a pencil tip burn. Um, they can irritate the soft tissues if they're left exposed, so cover it up if you have exposed metal in the area of the PEZ, for example, with bone wax or cement or bone graft substitute. Any of those things work, and we don't have any data to tell you to use one over the other in terms of uh, outcome. Structural allograft uh, used to be a lot more common, still used occasionally trying to restore bone stock, especially in younger patients where there may be some advantage to that. But uh, it's infrequently used now. It takes a lot of time. Uh, infection risk goes up with the length of the surgery, size of the components that you put in. Dead bone is at risk for infection. And the infections in these patients are really tough to take care of. Got a big hole at the beginning, gets infected, you have an even bigger hole at the end. So um, it's in the armamentarium, but infrequently used, I must say now. So getting down towards the end, uh, here's another question. 63-year-old uh, man, uh, eight years ago, came, came back for a follow-up exam, reports development of pain. Uh, he can walk short distances. Um, his, his infection workup is uh, negative. Um, and so how are we going to figure out what's wrong with this guy? And um, here's what the x-ray looks like. So. Um, we can see pretty dramatic uh, erosion of bone under the flange and anterior to the tibial component. And remember, osteolysis is always worse than it appears on the x-ray. So this is pretty alarming amount of bone resorption. He's doing as well as he is and didn't come any sooner because the components are still well fixed. And so analysis to some hip patients, you can get a lot of um, you know, osteolysis around components that are well fixed sometimes. And this delays their presentation, unless they're being followed regularly. So uh, what's the answer? Uh, in this case, knee revision was chosen by 100% of the respondents. I would revise that knee. That's too much bone loss for me. Um, it's stated here that, that bone grafting can be done with exchange of the insert. And that's true. But we tend to do that with minimal osteolysis patient at you know, 10, 12, 15 years, great knee, they start to get an effusion, poly wear, a little laxity, pop the liner and off they go. But you need to make sure the components are well positioned and you don't have large stress risers that are going to by themselves cause an even bigger problem left untreated. Um, I think uh, in terms of uh, general comments, pain scores are less favorable than primary needs, well, we all know along with activity scores. Uh, stiffness can sometimes be a problem. Longer surgeries, neurovascular problems uh, with uh, correction of valgus and flexion deformity and infection um, double the risk of primary knee, knee arthroplasty. Uh, so a real focus uh, for the future. Skin necrosis, a real problem. Try to avoid this. Use the most lateral incision that is usable. Um, and. Um, you know, have a good relationship with your plastic surgeon. You may need help. And in some cases, uh, tissue expanders, sham procedures, or other procedures by plastics ahead of time to cover the wound first, get it healed before you come back and do a big revision. The arthroplasty is the way to go to make it safer for the patient to avoid wound healing problems and a catastrophic deep infection. Uh, finally, extensor mechanism reconstruction. Um, 
this can be done with um, Allograft or Marlex Mesh. Um, uh, we've had better luck with the mesh. Uh, that I, I, we used to do a lot of the Allografts, and they're fun, and they look great at two or three years. But the problem is if you follow those, a lot of them start stretching out late. Um, and no matter how you do them, and no matter how tight you leave them, and we've had uh, less, not not 100% uh, success, but less trouble with stretch, particularly with patellar tendon disruptions with the mesh. Quadriceps disruptions, tougher. Uh, we've used the mesh for that too, um, but uh, uh, that requires uh, more extensive surgery and mobilization. Um, and, and I think uh, because you have poor tissue to fix to, not as reliable results. So here's a question, 63-year-old patient with paraprosthetic joint infection three years after primary knee, uh, two-stage exchange, um, articulating spacer. Uh, two months later, she's infection-free. Now it's time to reconstruct. And so your partner puts the case on, and in the middle of the case calls you in and says, you know, um, we took out the spacers, but we seem to have this pretty big hole. So uh, what do you think about this x-ray, and, you know, what do you want to do? And so... You can see the implant that was in there before, substantial bone loss on the tibial side, and now really massive bone loss on the tibial side. Now it says here that the, the ligaments are intact. Uh, makes you wonder um, on the medial side there, uh, you know, if that is truly intact and, and can be balanced. I think uh, even if there seems to be something there, you're worried it's attenuated, and so some type of varus valgus uh, protection at the very least would be needed, but my worry would be how to get fixation to this, because this is going to be you know, a trombone looking down at that tibia, and uh, similar to the femur, maybe that's a trumpet, not quite so big, but part of the trombone's missing on the medial side, in fact, uh, in this case, so really substantial defect. Of the available choices to address this, uh, um, impaction grafting, structural allograft, uh, the choice chosen here, tapestry sleeves, cementless stems. There's certainly people who would manage that case with uh, metaphyseal sleeve and press fit stems. Um, it can also be handled with uh, uh, porous metal cones and uh, um, either cemented or cementless stems. The reason that's the wrong choice here is it says address diaphyseal defects. So pay attention to the structure and these exams, how they're made. Um, if you really analyze critically these choices, the one best answer is answer number three, although there's clearly other ways uh, to handle this. Um, so, um, last this question is 65-year-old patient, periprosthetic infection, um, again, has a history of realignment. Um, he has uh, uh, lateral patellar tracking. Uh, he only flexes passively about 65, um, and uh, during exposure, uh, standard medial parapatellar approach is performed. He has uh, adequate uh, knee flexion to allow exposure, but um, you can't really get him open enough even after release of lateral gutters and excision of the scar. So this is another surgical exposure question. You know, tough knee, prior infection, contracted soft tissues, uh, low riding patella, and which exposure and this is kind of a repeat of before with the uh, uh, tubercle osteotomy answer number D. By the way, quadriceps snip, which is answer, uh, I believe, number uh, uh, A uh, with that oblique, um, uh, you know, incision of the, off the medial parapatellar thing is what we would begin with and uh, make work in the majority of the time. Avoid the uh, VY turndowns. That devascularizes the extensor mechanism. It's a really bad idea. Uh, studies showing very much impaired um, function of the knee in terms of quad power and strength after doing this. And so uh, I think uh, uh, not a good idea, and I don't think should be discussed or taught, quite honestly. I think it's of historical interest. So um, in this case, uh, tubercle osteotomy, Figure D was the uh, choice. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments.
Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.